Hello and welcome back to Storytime Classics Live. Today we have a very special interview with Trezana Beverly, Tony Award winner um, and star of Mabel Madness here <laughs> being broadcast by, star, uh, by Southwest uh, Shakespeare Company. Trezana, thank you for joining us today. How are you this fine day? I'm doing great. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I have a few questions uh, for you here. Uh, first of all, how, how is it in Arizona? How are, how are you enjoying your stay so far? Well, it's very nice. And of course, the, uh, the air is so special out here. And you notice it, you know. You know, living back in the East, uh, you know, we're dealing with a lot of car pollution, et cetera. But uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the pandemic has helped that a little bit, you know. But the air is beautiful. It's really fresh and nice. And the mountains Excellent. are wonderful. Let me pull up the <laughs> incredible. Um, just a moment. All right. Um we also uh, we were just delighted to have you in, in residence this week. Uh, I was, as I was saying earlier, working with uh, Maple Madness and and this this story that you you wrote yourself. It's yes, uh, it's the story of of Mabel Mercer, uh, who was allegedly Frank Sinatra's muse. Uh, can, can you tell us a little bit more without like <laughs> ruining the punchline or anything like that? Well, you know he. She came over here from France in 1938. And um, it was at that time that the singers of Frank Sinatra's generation, Mel Torme, Barbara Cook, um, Tony Bennett, they were all very young at the time. They were probably in their 20s. And um, it was Frank Sinatra who caught on to her first. And, uh, you know, he was a very serious singer. Uh, he was very serious. If you study his biography, he was very careful to understand, um, uh, you know, sight singing and, uh, you know, praising and things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, somehow he got wind of this British woman who was uh, singing uh, in these rooms in New York, and he started to um, go study her. He discovered her at a cafe named Frank's on, uh, I believe it was 57th Street, it was very famous. Uh, you know, it was just on the cusp of the speakeasies. You know, the speakeasies were going out of date, and these, these speakeasies were being transformed into nightclubs. And so uh, Frank Sinatra discovered her at a club named Tony's. And he continued to go and study her. He was taking notes. And uh, eventually he worked up enough nerve to um, speak to her directly and ask her if, if she would teach him her phrasing. And she did. And uh, he fell in love with her. And uh, he, he touted her praises um, forever. He wrote about her in his biography, and he was responsible for her getting the Presidential Medal of Freedom. He said everything he learned about phrasing, he learned from Mabel Mercer. Fascinating. That's, that's, that's so interesting. I love that. And I saw the show last night. Uh, I, ha I happen to have that, that privilege to see that. And it really is a fascinating story of how this, this all came together and her influence on, on so many people uh, and, and, uh, just an incredible performer that that she was. Um, now, if you will, we, we'd like to know more about about you. Um, I hear that you have a cat. <laughs> you have a cat that can stand on two feet uh, like a person. Yeah, yes, I do. And when I saw her do it for the first time, I was utterly fascinated. <laughs> I was home visiting my mom in Baltimore. And uh, mother was uh, cooking. She was in the kitchen. And my cat is very, very sensitive to aromas. She goes crazy, crazy 
she screams and hollers whenever she, you know, you're cooking and she smells food. So um, I, I was sitting on the sofa and Honey was, her name is Honey, and she was sitting there next to me and I turned around and she literally was standing on her two feet on the sofa. And I saw her do it again. I've seen her do it about three times and she'll stand on her two feet and then sometimes she'll crouch, you know, like a rabbit and stand back up, it's utterly amazing. And I said to my mother, I says, mother, I says, my cat stands on two feet like us. It's amazing. It's just the opposable thumbs that separate us or they would they would take over and rule us all. No, it's incredible. <laughs> now, speaking of cooking, we also hear that you are a very good cook yourself. Yes, I am. My father was a... Um, he was a cook. He cooked. He was in the merchant seaman and he was the head cook on the ship. Uh, my family, I come from a family of cooks. Uh, I used to overhear them giving each other notes at the end of the day, talking about, you know, the dressing for the turkey and, you know, comparing notes. They, they were they were very serious cooks. And um, my grandmother could also cook. So I grew up around people who really appreciated, um, you know, the, the, the quality of food and not to drown food in a bunch of gravy and sauces, but really appreciate, uh, you know, the flavors and blends and how things can come together. I enjoy it. It's, and it's, it's very um, calming. I used to watch my father um, baking and uh, he would sit there, he had a cigar, he used to smoke a cigar. And uh, he would sit there with a cigar in his mouth, I guess from time to time, some of the ashes did get into the batter. But um, <laughs> anyway, uh, but he seemed so meditative and so quiet. And I realize, and now that I do it too, there is something very calming about, it takes your mind off of things. Uh, that you can focus on something outside of your own thoughts and, you know, uh, cares, or should I put, you know, cares, I should put it that way. And um, I, I understand what he, I understand that now. You know, I like to cook. I am, and I've I, just and really I, started into and it I pretty myself, much, but I, I pretty much uh, cook every day for myself fresh. I never, I rarely order out. Very nice. I, I can understand the meditation and the, the calming and, and just the satisfaction in, in, in cooking a meal. Um, I can understand just, just all of that completely. Uh, and now <laughs> I, I've been reading, beating around the bush here. And now for, for, for the obvious, obvious question that's being couched by, by many pleasantries and, 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 and cooking talk, <laughs> um, you have a lot of awards. What is it like getting a Tony? That's a good question. Um, well, I was very young at the time. I, you know, well, I was very young at the time. Um, I kind of had a feeling that I was going to get the Tony. Uh, my, I came out of Tisch School for the Arts at NYU. Mm -hmm. And one of my uh, teacher mentors, and I would have to call him that, was a man named Omar Shapley. Omar Shapley studied, came out of Second City and had worked with uh, Elaine May, Viola Spolin, all of those good people. And, um, you know, he was proficient with theater games. And um, I discovered very early on in my uh, school career that I was a very physical actress close to a dancer, but not quite. And um, Omar, Omar and I just developed a very um, smooth uh, rapport with one another. And um, he accompanied me to the Tonys. The school got me a, uh, ordered me a limo. Uh, my family came up and uh, it was, it was just, um, it, it was just quite amazing. Now I've seen footage of me getting the Tony. And it's uh -huh. so interesting because I truly do look like a deer with the, you know, in the flashlights. <laughs> I look so, so scared, so innocent, so naive. Um, I, I, just, I just laugh every time I look at it. And I said, gee whiz, I said, if I get another one, 
I said, there'll be a big contrast between <laughs> that one and this one. Trust me. That must be something, seeing yourself up there uh, accepting such a prestigious award and, and, and just sort of having an out-of-body experience and, and wondering, wow, was that, re was that real? <laughs> well, I'll share, can I share you one more antidote behind that one? Please do. When you leave the stage, they, they, they take you to a room where you're supposed to sit. And then, you know, when, um, they, when they go to break, then you can come out and go to your seat. Well, no one told me that. <laughs> and I sat in that room all through the end of the show. Oh no. And when they sang, and when they sang uh, there's no business like show business, you don't see me on the stage because I'm back in the room. Oh so, no, just. <laughs> I couldn't get out. Oh no! But that's a I'll great. I'll never story. forget it. It, 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 it was at Tony Hill. <laughs> Let me out! I want to be part of the end number. I couldn't bang on the door. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry that happened. But it's such a uh, such a great story. <laughs> I know it's a great story. And of course, you know, we will not let that happen again. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Trust me. You're going to have certain measures. I will measures not be in going place. in any little rooms. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, 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 I see that you, you grew up in Baltimore. Uh, yeah. Listening to I, I, I'm I'm reminded how a, a, a Southern Baltimore can be. How can a Southern Baltimore be? Tell me. How can it? Huh? Uh, listening to you, I, I, I'm reminded how a Southern Baltimore can be is one of the oh, questions. I don't know. I mean, you know, Baltimore. Baltimore is Southern. Mm -hmm. It is a Southern state. I mean, it was. On, it's on the Mason Dixon line. Uh huh. But or it's more Southern than it is North. It really is a Southern. It's a is it a mixture of, of, of like both cultures at once? So I mean, is it is it kind of? You know, I Baltimore unfortunately was the last state in the union to be integrated. Mm -hmm. To drop, well, I should put it this way: to drop its Jim Jim Crow laws. Um, I think we're looking at the mid forties where African American parents could not take their children to the park to swing, to play in a certain section of the park, they would be arrested. We had terrible Jim Crow laws in Baltimore. And so the city um, I would say has remained fairly divided uh, we had a terrible drug problem some years ago, which is very slowly beginning to clear itself up. There's been a lot of abandoned buildings in Baltimore, um, but we have a very we have a very good governor and mayor now, and um, you know they've been working very very hard to uh, you know advance the profile of Baltimore. You know Baltimore has gone through a lot. Baltimore's going through a lot. Absolutely. Um, as we were talking earlier, uh, it, it is true that, that you were in some of the inaugural classes at the Tisch School for Performing Arts at NYU. Uh, do you still travel to Tisch uh, circles uh, from those days? Do you still? Oddly you? enough, I don't. Interestingly enough, I, I kind of, I'm a little closer to the Juilliard School than I am to Tisch. I find that fascinating. I did do, I, you know, I've done a lot of directing in the, in the schools and the colleges around country uh, because I'm also a director. Mm. And um, I directed a couple of my first productions at Tisch. But after that, um, I did work at the uh, Juilliard School for quite a few years and uh, really developed a rapport with the, um, with the faculty there and I think about that from time to time. Um, and it's interesting because when, when, when 
the School for the Arts was originally created, it was created by these incredibly brilliant uh, performing masters in, in acting and, and, and movement, Carlo Mazzoni, Lloyd Richards, uh, you know, Peter Cass, Kristen Linkletter for voice. I mean, Irene Bird in movement. I mean, it was the creme de la creme. And we, we, and of course it was on the cusp of the avant-garde theater. You know, you had the open theater, the living theater that was, you know, cresting at that time. And these artists, these performing artists were very, very interested in changing the, the, the profile of the American theater. They, they felt, found themselves to be revolutionaries. And that's the way they taught us. So we we were brought up in, you know, very um, avant-garde, cutting-edge performance styles, et cetera. Now, we learned the classics. You know, I can do the classics. Yes, you but can. Ju Juilliard, Juilliard, a few years after we opened, it's interesting because I can remember us talking amongst ourselves as, student, as students about Juilliard. And of course, Juilliard focused on uh, the classics more or less. And so there was probably some bit of a rivalry for a while there, you know. But I, I have more of a rapport with the Juilliard school than I do with NYU, tell the truth. But I, I mean, I, I use their studios. I mean, I, you know, I do communicate with them, but I, I can't say that, you know, I'm sort of inside their circle. That famous dress that you that you that you wore in for color girls who considered suicide when the rainbow is enough, that now hangs in the Smithsonian Institution National Museum for African American History and Culture. Talk about a surreal experience! Isn't that something? How does that quite make wonderful. you feel? Well, it's quite wonderful, and my cousin told me that the dress was there. Uh, I did not know that. Um, and one of the great joys of my life is that my mother recently passed away. But before she passed away, I think now it's probably been about maybe four years, five years ago, we took her there to see the dress along with the other memorabilia from For Colored Girls because there, there's other memorabilia in the case. Um, and my dear, dear mother held court she was in a wheelchair and we drove and we put her up in front of the, the case. And my mother, everyone that came by, she, that's my daughter, you know. Do, uh, Traz, uh, give them an autograph, give them an autograph. Do you want to take a picture? Do you want to take a picture? It was something, but I know that it was one of the great joys of my mom's life to be, to be there, you know. That's oh, that's it. fantastic. I love that story. Um, uh, all right. This, this comes to the, the, the uncomfortable question. <laughs> it's not that uncomfortable. It's the standard question that I ask of, of my guests to ask me something. I'm, I'm sure that there are lots of things that you would like to know about me. Uh, so uh, fire, fire away. <laughs> I, 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 because I, because I asked the question to someone in the car, I think I asked it to Mary yesterday. Who is Bo Hackman? <laughs> Who is? <laughs> That's a very uh -huh. good question. Yeah, you know why you know why I asked that question? Because um you in rehearsal, you know, you have been so accommodating and kind and you seem to be this mysterious person who just sort of is there and so willing to do things. And and I'm going, who is this man, you know? And that's really the question I have for you. Surprise, right? <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. Um, I just, uh, I, I sort of do almost a, a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. um, actor, uh, I, I, I work on props. I am cameraman uh, for, for this uh, show and have been for for the solo fest, uh, festival uh, for uh, Deborah Ann Bird, who was last uh, last week, um, mm -hmm. I, I I I do a lot of production uh, assistant activities. Uh, 
and uh, just really try and support the company. So that's that's sort of <laughs> that's sort of who I am. Uh, um, just of uh, jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> You you obviously love the theater and you love that you love the environment and the and the experience of it because uh, you know you're there you know and willing to be and then let me tell you people like you are very very important it really means something to have somebody you you can just say can can you help me out with this or blah blah, blah. and then you know you don't get somebody that goes you know looks cross-eyed at you, but someone that is so kind and generous. And I noticed that about you. And I said, who Thank is you this so much. man? That, 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 yes. That, that, that wow. <laughs> Give me a moment here. <laughs> I know. You weren't expecting that, were you? I'm a very oh. observant person. I always talk to my students about being <laughs> observant. And I observe that. Mm -hmm. See, you weren't expecting that, were you? <laughs> well, th thank you so much uh, uh, for your very, very kind words there. <laughs> um, moving on with with questions to to, to you again. I mean, what do you, what is your best story? What what is what is your worst story from from your life? I, uh, you, you, that that kind of puts you on the spot. You don't have to answer that, but 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 just out of curiosity, do you do you have a, a good a, a story of your of a, either your best day or your worst day or both? I don't know. That's, you know, for, I think that, you know, for an African-American young woman in the theater, fair-skinned woman, naive, I, I would say this. Um, I did not realize when I got the Tony, uh, I really didn't realize what I had. And at that time, it was not easy finding representation. And um, I did not have a mentor at that time. And I always tell my students, it's very, very, very important to get a mentor. Maybe, maybe two, not your friends, because your friends are gonna tell you what you want to hear. And they don't have experience. You need to have someone who knows the business, who can guide you through it in making those very, very tough decisions. This is a very extraordinary and exceptional profession. Most people are not actors. Uh, and it's a high risk profession. And um, you need to have people who understand that and can help you make wise decisions. I did not have that. And subsequently, it was like I was going through a revolving door. Uh, things happened very, very quickly. Your life can really change on a dime when you get a major award like that, major exposure. Uh, it's like I went through this really fast moving revolving door and one day I found myself on the outside. And that's when you have to make a decision. You really want to keep going with this. Is, this. is this what you do? And I had no choice. I'm called to this profession. It's who I am. And uh, thank God I have more than one talent because I, as you know, I teach, I direct, and um, I write. And, uh, and it, was with, it, it was with those other talents and gifts that I've been given that I continued my career and I've managed to stay in the game. But it wasn't because I had taken advantage of certain opportunities that were offered me that I just didn't understand what I had. I really didn't understand what I had. And there were very few people around me to make it very clear. For example, someone would say to me, well, you know you can have anything you want. 
what does that mean to a kid in her 20s who has not had any experience? What are you talking about? And that's all that they would say. Keep moving, you know. So, uh, you know, I, I learned that lesson. It, it was heartbreaking because um, I, I, I knew my artistry. I knew the talent that I had. And, of course, I was very young at the time. But um, that, that's been my biggest lesson. And, and, and that's what I can, I can share with my students. It's very, very important not to let those opportunities get away from you because they don't come around often. And you must know how to strike while the iron is hot and take advantage of those great moments that come along. But like I said, I was blessed because I have all these other talents and that's what I use. And when I put it in perspective, I think that I was supposed to use these other talents. And if I had uh, gone in, if I had been working as profusely as some of my colleagues on TV are, because my generation is up there on TV. I mean, you see them all the time. Maybe I would not have influenced some of the students that I've had or write some of the plays that I've written or direct some of the shows. And, and they have been important and have had an influence. So you know, at the end of the day, it's not been wasted. Uh, and we, we are so grateful for, for what you have contributed and, and all the things that you have directed and written and the students that you've influenced. Um, just an incredible person. Thank you, Trezana Beverly. Uh, th th this is something what I know I'm going to remember uh, all of my life, and I, I, I hope uh, all of our viewing audience remembers all of their lives. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for talking with us. Please come back to us again. Um, and uh, I, I, I really recommend everyone to, to tune into um, or, or, or get tickets to our, our live broadcast of uh, or not live broadcast, but by bro our broadcast of of uh, Mabel Madness, um, and and uh, it, it just an amazing ex experience. I I, I am <laughs> a, a bit flummoxed and a bit nervous. So thank you, <laughs> thank you so much for speaking with us today. You're very very welcome, Bob. Thank um, you. Have you with us? Thank you so much. Um, thank you. And we will be talking. Uh, I will be talking with you later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. See you. See you everyone soon. Everyone, to this very special uh, Storytime Classics live with with uh, our interview with Trezana Beverly, um, and and um, let me see here. I, I see if uh, there are any actual questions from the audience. Uh, I, I forgot to even turn that over. Um, let's see here. Some wonderful compliments, wonderful, wonderful stuff. A question, how will these changing times affect your future writing? Um, you know, um, I, have, I have said to my students that when the um, social milieu is as it is like now, um, it gives writers wonderful um, food wonderful fodder for developing uh, their plays, their stories. Um, when I came out of NYU, we were in the mid to late 70s. And of course, we had the, uh, the assassination of Dr. King, Kennedy, uh, Malcolm X, it was such a turbulent period. However, however, as actors, you could walk out on the street and get a job because so many playwrights were writing profusely. They were just writing their fingers off and they needed actors, you know. Uh, so there, there is a, a lot of material, a lot of material now for 
writers to uh, dig their brains into. You know, I've written a theater dance piece. My brand is theater dance. I've written a theater dance piece called A Song for Mara, the Story of a Homeless Woman. I mean, so all of these issues, all of these social issues are very present right now. And uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful time to be a writer. Absolutely. I, I bring, yeah, it's, it's just, it's the time where, where, where people are open to hear these stories and I think it can change lives. Um, so mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you for participating in that. I believe that is all of the questions that I have right now. Um, wait, let's see. Also, do you see the rise of women in theater expanding? I'm sure that it will. I'm sure that it will. Um, and it's a, and it's a good thing too, you know, it, you know, variety is, is, is the best part of life. I mean, you've got to have perspective from, um, from every angle and women bring a different uh, level of sensibility to, to the work, uh, you know, and, um, also of course, you know, we talk about stories that pertain to women. It gives, women can give voice to uh, women's issues uh, more than men can, although there are some men who do write very, very well for, for females. Um, and then you have um, the validation of female directors, filmmakers. I'm just so excited to see how many women are now directing film, how many women of color are directing film to uh, break this glass ceiling because, I mean, we have been so oppressed so oppressed, you know, and uh, now things are beginning to even itself out. So I think it's a great thing. It is. It is indeed. Um, thank you. Uh, so many people are just just uh, writing wonderful things here, saying thank you for bringing your love and experience to Southwest Shakespeare. We are grateful. And that is indeed the case. Thank you so much for spending your time with us and and uh, sharing these incredible stories and your wisdom and, and experience. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Bo. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in to Storytime Classics Live. Uh, we will be back with regular programming on Monday, and we will see you then. Until then, tune in to Trajana Beverly's Mabel Madness, and you can get tickets at Show Tickets for You on the uh Scroll at the very bottom. It says show tickets for you.com backslash events backslash SW Shakespeare. Thank you for tuning in today. Have a great rest of your day. And please remember, stay safe out there.